Blend it, get him in and let's go. Hi, I'm Stephen Grace, class of 1998 and a four-year member of the West Branch High School football team. Spending four years in the program seems like a long time, but is merely a drop in the bucket when it comes to the overall history of the sport in town. Throughout the years, countless young men have put on the West Branch uniform. Big or small, freshman or senior, each one has spent months in the fall working endless hours to prepare for nine weeks of memories. And each and every season, no matter the records, the players can look back and know they were part of something special. During this video, we'll look back and see what the game was like in its early days. As we progress through the years, we will glance at the great teams and the players and coaches that made them so. We'll also get first-hand account of what it's like to play for West Branch, one of the best football programs in the state of Iowa. This project has been several years in the making, with many people working many hours to bring you the most comprehensive look back at the sport. So sit back and enjoy. The game came to West Branch near the turn of the 20th century. Before the days of presidential museums and national parks, the town had fairgrounds on the south side, near where the Oval and Prairie now sit. That is where the team played their home games. The rules of the game were quite different, with game times ranging up to 70 minutes and the field being 110 yards long with no end zone. Initially, teams played with 24 players to a side, although that was reduced to 15 and then the traditional 11. In the early 1900s, the team moved east a few blocks, just south of the railroad tracks where Baronic Park is currently located. After the high school was built in 1919, the town's men donated their time and horses to transform the old playground on Oliphant Street into an athletic field. Using shovels, dirt scoops, and wheelbarrows, the men worked for months to dig the earth out and level it up. In 1920, the field was dedicated and the first game was played there. We never have played out here on the, on the athletic site. Uh, the school board at one time kind of wanted to do that and I think the community persuaded them to, to not do that. There's been a lot of grandfathers and grandsons and fathers, et cetera, play on Elephant Street Field, the Little Rose Bowl, and it's not something that the school administration really wants to follow that much. They know that it's a lot of tradition laden downtown, and when you step on the field at West Branch, you step down there that, you know, for a lot of different athletes. That field, I think, was dredged out in 1919 by a team of horses, a variety of teams of horses, and they took all the dirt out of there and it's been a real legend through, you know, throughout the state of Iowa. The field was used for more than sports though. Many town gatherings took place. The most famous of these was in 1928 when Herbert Hoover returned home to start his campaign for the presidency. Tents were placed over the entire field, seating for 18,000 was available, and special accommodations were made for the 250 reporters in attendance. Despite a vicious thunderstorm the night before, the town got everything in order and sent their local son on his way to the White House. In the 1940s, the field was renovated again, giving Oliphant Street Field the amphitheater look it has today, thus leading to the nickname the Little Rose Bowl. Other renovations have been done to keep the field in shape, including an expanded press box, more bleacher seating, and new goalposts. Over the years, there have been many great teams, players, and coaches who have put on a West Branch uniform. Some of the early records show very successful teams, dating back to the first teams the town produced. In 1916, it cost just 25 cents to get into a game to see the Fighting Quakers go 5-2, the first winning season on record. In 1926, E.L. Fisher took over as the coach of the Quakers and started one of the most successful runs in West Branch football history. In 1927, West Branch won the conference title with a 5-3 record. In the next two years, the Quakers went 8-1 and 9-1, and winning the conference title for the second and third straight seasons. 1929 saw one of the most dominating seasons as the team outscored its opponents 192 to 12. Quarterback Cecil Butler ran for 1,034 yards on 217 carries to lead the team. 1929, when we had an undefeated team, and we had our picture taken at the north end of the football uh, field here. Of course, I was in a lot better shape at that time than I am now. So, <laughs> our 192 points that we had scored in and our opponents had only have scored 12. So we must have had a pretty decent team. 1921 and 1922. That was Buzz, right? Yeah, they're okay. And uh, his big moment was he beat City High three to nothing the year he was a senior. <laughs> and he always remarked about right after World War I, they come back to high school, and he said they could be 25 years old and still playing. Said there really some good teams right now.
The Quakers continued their success in the 1930s, winning another conference title in 1933 under Fisher, this time with a perfect 9-0 record. Yeah, well, Gene Moore, was a, that was the first team I remember, it was a 33 team. Gene Fisher was the coach. Gene Moore was a star. He wanted to come on with was the captain of the great football team, and Drake was a Division one team. Fisher is second on the all-time wins list in school history with 53. In 1936, Ted Monsander took over the helm to lead the Quakers for the last four years of the decade. The 1940s saw a lot of change, but similar results. While the Quakers became known as the Bears, the winning continued as 1940 was the lone year with a losing record. Andy Cantor, Grant Peterson, Jack Lawn, and Clyde Fink all took turns coaching the Bears. Peterson was the coach in 1941 when the Bears went to West Liberty, one of the earliest games recorded on videotape. Our last game of the season, and uh, November 11th, we always played them on November 11th. And well, that one was at West Liberty, but it was we played on the fairgrounds because they didn't have a football field yet at that time, and they had their football field down on the fairgrounds. And uh, yeah, but we had a uh, that was one of our better games. I think we lost we lost it, but uh, uh, 13 to eight. We had them eight to nothing at halftime. There's one incident, not a, really a play. We were playing Wapolo one night. It's uh, a night games, of course. And uh, Glenn Hope backsided some player from Wap Wapolo. The grass was wet. And he slid that kid about 20 yards outside, outside the fence. We used to have a fence along the field with a big wooden post and a um, you know, wire rope seating. And Coach Hipple just, just, just blew himself. He just couldn't. He said, after the game, he said, I would have rather gotten beat than to win a game like that. Because we were kind of dirty in that game. So it was a late hit, and it was so obvious. It was just, just, oh, it's bad. West Branch had a pretty rough 10 year period from the time of the 1933 championship team until we came along. And uh, Doc Gerlitz was a football fan in town, and he decided they're going to make some changes. So he went to Upper Iowa and got Grant Peterson. And uh, L.A. Bailey came over from Springdale, and he was a big football fan. So they had a meeting out the town hall and decided that this was enough. So they changed the school colors to red and white. And Chris just run wild that year. I don't. They said he was overlooked a year before, but. Chris Christensen, yeah. Okay. When we were juniors, uh, we started wearing red uh, jerseys, but the, the school colors were still purple and white, and they had been before that. And uh, of course, our our jackets, our school jackets, were all purple and with the white bears and lettering on them, and. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was right at that time that they, they they went to red and white on the school colors, I think. Speed Christensen, we call him. But in college, we'd have to be an Alakinic because I watched all those 1939 games with an Alakinic. So, and back back in those years, everybody wanted to be an Alakinic in the backyard games. They would play, play during that. But no, Speed Christensen. 43 and 44 teams, both coached by Les Hipple, highlighted the decade. The Bears went 7 and 2 and 9 and 0 respectively, and won the conference title both years. We were undefeated for eight games when playing West Liberty at West Liberty. At that time, they played in the middle of the racetrack. You know, that was where the football field was. But anyway, uh, we practiced all week that if we received that we'd pull a sleeper play on the first play. 
you know. Now he's the eighth in sleeper bay, but you know what he played was literally anything's fair, you know. So anyway, we won the toss and we got the we received on the kickoff, so I got the ball and I ran to the West River side of the field and as soon as they tackled me, why we got right over the ball. Jake stayed over on our side. Lathrop hit him with a fast one, 80 yards for a touchdown the first play. First play. Well, I tell you, that took the wind out of their sails. I mean, you know, that, that dirty play, but it, it really demoralized him, you know, when he going the first play. But we ended up winning like 30 something to nothing, but, you know, what it's over with. But, you know, West Liberty, West Mitch is always a knockdown drag out, you know. But Fred Alban was a big football man, and he brought in Niall Kinnick and uh, Duke Slater at the at their football man. But that was the biggest, that was really a treat, because they were the two biggest stars that I ever had at that time. And he got them to come over here, and I remember that was pretty exciting. We just did. Uh, I, think, I think we just had more fun than anything else. We had, uh, of course, we went to, uh, like those, those fellows that gave us, put the banquet on for us, they also were some of the mainstays on, uh, we had, uh, they, somebody had to take cars to the games. We didn't take any buses or anything like that to the games. And all of those guys would take a bus or a carload of players, you know, to the games. And uh, that's that's the way we got around. All three Rumbles was played in the backfield at the same time. You know, and uh, the pitch was quite a, used to get in a few arguments in the huddle, too. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I had brother, brother Don to say, God, you called that play three times, we haven't made an inch, you know. And Jake would say, well, shut up, you know, and stuff up all the plays. And, you know, it got a little tough once, once in a while. But uh, had a, game, a, a winning streak of like 26 in a row before we played it. And I think this is probably a first that they sent scouts to scout them. You know, that many years ago, nobody scouted teams and stuff. And it was a good thing because they had a couple of razzle-dazzle plays. One of them were the, the whole line would line up on one side of the center, and that made the center an end. And he, the quarterback come up in tight T, and he'd snap the ball to him for a second, then he'd lay it back in his hand, and he'd stay down on the ball, they'd round the end like it was going to be an end run, he'd straighten up and walk down the sidelines for a touchdown. And, oh. uh, but anyway, the, the, they pulled that one, boy, boy, we were all aware of it. See, and as soon as he snapped that ball, all of our line would hit the center. I mean, he never moved out of his tracks. <laughs> yeah, that was Memorial Day. Oh, okay. uh, the, traditionally, it was always Memorial Day against West Liberty, you know, in the afternoon. It was always during the day. You know, we played most of our games at night. In fact, okay. all the rest of them, yeah. Oh, okay. And did you play an Alton Street field? Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. Okay. Now, they, it was about two years before they modified it, you know, they they moved it, I don't know, 20 yards north, I think it was. So, uh, like that's, that's the one year they played down at the park, down at the Hoover Park. Football field was always there, but they took the north end of it out and, and put the baseball field at the south end, and so they moved a lot of dirt all summer. And, uh, we played our first game in Hoover Park because it wasn't ready. So it would have been our, probably our third game was University High in Iowa City. We played first game on Alton Street Field as it is today. Yeah, I guess that's a no-brainer on my part because when I was a senior, the last game of the year was against West Liberty. And they were unbeaten and we had lost a game. And uh, so if we won, we probably would tie for the conference championship. And uh, it woke up in that first morning, that morning, and it was snowing out there. And, and it wasn't a heavy snow, but it was heavy enough they got the town maintainer out. And we played in the afternoon, by the way. Anyway, they graded off, and of course, they turned the, turned the field into a quagmire. <laughs> but, but anyway, in the, the last part of the game, we were behind seven to six with about four minutes left, and they had to kick, and they kicked to me, and I was lucky enough to run it back for a touchdown, and, and we finally ended up beat them 12 to seven. And after that, that game was over, a couple of individuals met at the, at the tavern downtown, and there was quite a bit of money exchanged. <laughs> Jane's <laughs> hands, I guess. We played Mount Vernon up there in there. Ugly place. <laughs> it had rained all day. It was muddy. Mount Vernon's undefeated. 
and uh, we'd made an adjustment to a play and that we were sure they were looking for and, and uh, I forget what quarter it was but anyway uh, the end of that was it was a we turned the reverse into a double reverse and Keevan KL knocked two guys on their butts and I ran 60 yards for the touchdown and we beat them 14 to 12. And one of my teammates, number 42, was Butch's dad. That'd be Butch, Cody Butch. Norm dad. Peterson. Really? Norm Peterson. Uh, he played, now they call it a tight or a wide receiver, but back then was just, you were just an end. But, uh, Is that the position you played down? Or what I played fullback and de uh, defensive tackle, but and defensive end. But I want to tell you about Butch's dad. He was had a great, great, great receiver, uh, and he had a, as Hayden Frey used to say, he had a little hitch in his get along, uh, and then later years, Raymond Berry played for the Oakland Raiders. He the he reminded me so much of Norm Peterson, but Norm had great hands. And not very big, not very, not very heavy, but he's a tough kid, a good football player. I remember Fred Alban, you know, that he used to auctioneer in West Liberty and stuff, and boy, before that West Liberty game, he'd come up and give us a pep talk. And in fact, the old man would go over there at the butcher shop, and Fred would give them, give him some steaks, take it home, feed them to them boys and stuff. Just, you know, he was really, a, especially for against West Liberty, you know. That, uh, uh, he was a big fan, you know, of uh, West Branch, you know, was for years and years and years. In fact, it was, you know, that's a rivalry over the years and stuff, you know, that that uh, the season was a success if he could just beat West Liberty, you know. I would say Floyd Christensen probably was my I, ideal player back then. And he was, a, he was a back, right? He was a back, very fast. They had a good, they had a very good team, of course. Now you said your freshman year, that team went... Uh, they were unbeaten, yeah. Unbeaten. Mm -hmm. But my dad, during the war... And that would be... Uh, L.P. LP Foster. Pat yep. Foster. Okay. Foster. But during the war, he would go to all the games, write down every play, every, 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 every game, and send it to the soldiers. So I really appreciated that. But he was probably uh, the one I remember the most. And of course, the, all the coaches, Les, Les Hippel and Grant Peterson, and uh, those are the two that I played for. Well, they all did. They all supported. Didn't matter home or away, they were always all there. Of course, the young guys got to remember that television wasn't in yet, and that was the best show in town. decade brought another conference championship. In 1956, Coach Lyle Smith led the team to an 8-1 mark. Bud Andrus, Wilson Ledee, Smith, and Gary Growwinkle combined to lead the Bears to another winning decade. We called all, well, we called all the plays from, from the field. Occasionally, oh, yeah, you know, right. he might, we might huddle and he might send, uh, send a play in, but uh, uh, basically, uh, you know, we had a, a, a bunch of guys that, you know, had some football skills and, and football mentality and, and could, you know, we could do it. You know, and another thing that that, that really did was uh, conditioning paid off. You know, I can remember a game, oh my gosh, uh, against Columbus Junction. They had a lot of big boys. We were a bunch of little runts up here in West French <laughs> Bears, but they had a lot of big, big uh, defensive linemen, but we just wore them out, you know, so uh, um, there was, a, it was, it was a lot of fun. And, and we used the uh, um, the Oklahoma split tee, and uh, holy cow! You know our coach Bud Andrus. Uh, and, uh, he was our head coach, and and Red Light he was our assistant. And uh, you know Bud came up with this, and it was a good scheme. And and he was uh, he was a good uh, strategist. He was a uh, he uh, he was, and he was a, a a great guy, a great guy to play for. We 
We all have a lot of good memories of Bud. That's great. We had a coach, Donnie Ruscha. He was our line coach. He had a very, very loud voice. And uh, over here by the 30-yard uh, line on the east side, he would uh, had us go through a scrimmage one day and we didn't do anything right. And when we got through with practice and went downtown, the people downtown says, you guys really must have had a bad day because we could hear Yerusha loud and clear. <laughs> One of the things that, that he did was Thursday night before the game, we'd all go over to his house and we'd play little cards and eat little popcorn. And then at the end of the evening, we'd just talk about what we wanted to do the next day. And, and we were successful, uh, except the Mount Vernon game. We lost the Mount Vernon game. Is that the only game that you lost? Yeah. Holy cow. I think we tied Wapolo, as I recall. Oh, that's... I guess the thing I enjoy is we beat West Liberty. <laughs> <laughs> that back... was that way back then. Yeah, yeah. that was, Great. you know, Great. and when I was growing up, they always, uh, uh, West Branch and West Liberty always played on Armistice Day before Veterans Day. And I remember standing in the old school that burnt down and standing in there in the in the, in the in the boys' restroom, lavatory, and looking out the window when they were cleaning snow off the field to be able to play that day and, and oh you know, it was, uh, that was, that was a, a traditional, a real traditional rival. The first question an adult would ask, are you going out for football? Uh, what position are you gonna go out for? And, and it's, it is a strong football community. Winkle continued to lead the Bears in 1960 and 1961, including a 7-1 mark in 61. That team was led by Warren Pierce, a player who could do everything. He still holds the school record for touchdowns in a game with seven against Tipton that year. Pierce also rushed for over 1,000 yards in two straight seasons. The person that really sticks out in my mind when I was growing up as a, you know, a youngster or a grade schooler was Warren Pierce. 
you know, I mean, he was by far the one of the most talented athletes that ever came through West Branch. And I mean, when he got on the football field, I mean, he lit things up. Uh, the one that would stick out the most would have been my senior year against Tipton. Um, we uh, beat him up pretty bad, and uh, it was probably the best game I ever had. Just things always seemed to fall into place in that game, and I think seven touchdowns come out of that, and uh, and didn't get to play much in the second half because we were quite a ways ahead at halftime. So. Uh, it, and they were picked to win the Walmart Conference that year, so it was it was always fun to try to beat up on Tipton. <laughs> you knew when he had the football and the things he could do was just unbelievable, and he always gave it a 110 percent every time he played, you know. And it was he was really a fun guy to watch. As a player, there's a lot of athletes I remember that uh, inspire me to want to play football. Um, I remember Dick Crawl, Keith Sheely, James Lloyd, John Little. Uh, just a few, and I, I know I'm going to miss some that I really wish I'd mentioned. Um, Warren Pierce was someone I got to play with. He's a senior in my freshman year. I remember him scoring seven touchdowns against Tipton in the opening game. He was explosive as an athlete. Um, I remember Chuck Crawl and Keith Kephart, uh, the Co Co Dave Kozine, the Ruszek twins. Uh, uh, oh, you're going down a Hall of Fame. There, there's a lot of my brother Jim was a quarterback with yeah. some of those teams, and um, Gary Gronkle was a coach that came out of Iowa, and uh, he, he was a very good coach before Roger Hansen came in my sophomore year. Two in particular, Jack Hoffman and uh, Bert Thumb, and uh, just really enjoyed. Uh, that's when I started keeping scrapbooks and doing all the things that young players do when they look up to people and. I think the one that I remember most uh, when I was younger with uh, Larry Rummels and Joe Rummels are all my brothers basically as we grew up was Warren Pierce. Uh, he was somebody that I remember very well and I also remember the little boys, uh, Wilbur and Catherine's kids. They were, I was a lot younger. They moved to West Branch the day I was born. Uh, 1949 and I remember those kids as they went through and uh, was very uh, proud to be their neighbor. The, uh, Wilbur Little and Catherine Little were fine people. Roger Hansen succeeded Growwinkle in 1962, and he began to transform the program. The 1966 team finished the season ranked number one in the state of Iowa for all classes, going 8-0 and featuring a defense that allowed 36 points all season. The team also had two youngsters who would later come back to the program as coaches and lead the team to glory. Roger played me at an offensive guard when I was a freshman because I didn't block very well and he was going to teach me how to block. And so I had an opportunity to play a lot of different spots and I had an opportunity to play with a lot of good players during that course of the time in West Branch football. No doubt Roger Hansen had a big influence on, on my life and my football career as I grew up. Uh, you know, he was from kind of the old school, you know, a disciplinarian and, uh, you know, everything was hard-nosed. So you had to be, he really built you up to be psychologically a, a tough football player. You know, from the very first practice, you know, I mean, he came out of the Marines as a Marine drill sergeant and uh, uh, he would make you the, the toughest guy around. And my head coach was uh, Roger Hansen and uh, he was a great football coach and taught me a lot about life. You know, and he would always uh, play all these uh, psychological uh, games with you, you know, where he would pit you against the whole world. You know, this team, this is, everybody was against us. You know, the town was against us, the parents were against us, the only, the only people we could de depend on were the guys on the team, you know, and, you know, and in some instances he'd be really tough on you, and the next instance he'd be the most sentimental, uh, emotional guy you've ever seen, he'd be crying and say, you guys have got to do this, you know, and he could really, he could really get the most out of you, and uh, I really, you know, respected him and uh, really, well, you know, wanted to do your best for him, and I think everybody on the team played their, their hardest for that guy. He was really, you know, quite a guy. And he was a tough sucker. If he told you to sit down, you better not look for a chair. And that's the way it was. He was a Marine DI that came straight from us during our PE classes instead of going out and playing volleyball or whatever they do. He put us on the field and we marched. We had calisthenics, we went down the football field, we marched, we came back up, and he taught us discipline, he taught us how to get in shape, he taught us camaraderie, he taught us class, and those kinds of things have kind of ho hopefully carried over into what we do now in our coaching staff.
The uh, University uh, High game, uh, which the school is no longer in existence, is West High now, I guess. But uh, we were undefeated and they were undefeated. We were playing over at the Iowa practice field. And it was the night of the homecoming parade for the University of Iowa. And there was such a demand for people to get to the game that they postponed the game or uh, delayed the game so people could go to the homecoming parade and still make the, uh, the football game. So How'd that game turn out? We won 21 to 6. <laughs> we had a, that first year, uh, we went undefeated. Uh, I didn't have much to do about it with it. Of course, I thought I did, but I, I know I didn't. It was all, all taken care of before I got here. But uh, they, they had been uh, geared for it and worked hard. Steve Nash and Larry Williams, Ron Peterson, and there, there were a lot of them that uh, were very tough. But I was always uh, proud to say that I coached at West Branch. And, you know, the, I used to tell the kids at DeWitt when we went there, we had pretty good facilities when I went to DeWitt. Uh, that was a little different. When I came here, we uh, one thing I remember uh, coming from college, of course, we didn't have a practice field. We went down and practiced, and uh, I think it was John Beach's Diverted Acres down there. And, uh, you know, nowadays uh, uh, they wouldn't put up with that. Uh, we went down. The weeds were about that high when we started, and, and it wasn't very smart in those days. But thought, we thought you were tough, you know, if you didn't have to have any water. And, Jesus, the wonder we didn't lose somebody, you know, it's a, a miracle. Uh, we'd, go down, <laughs> we'd go down there and practice for two hours in the weeds and the dust, and it was uh, quite remarkable. Bad one, I guess, the first game, <laughs> the first game that I ever coached as a head coach, we played uh, Belle Plain, and that year they were the mythical, that was before the playoffs, and they were ranked number one, and, and uh, we went over there, and I think they beat us something like 64 to nothing. And I thought, gee, many. I thought I knew something about football, and I found out how little I knew. And but what really goes to show what great kids we had, though, because uh, they came back, and we I think we lost about three more games, then we won four or five in a row, four I think. So uh, I, I have some very fond memories, especially the kids, because I was fresh out of college, and as I said, I I thought that I knew. Uh, a lot, and I knew very little. And they were very supportive, and uh, uh, you know, really stuck behind me and stuck together. And and I, I really, not so much then. As I grew older, of course, I learned to appreciate that so much that they put up with me, and uh, and they were a great group of kids. Uh, the community in general, and uh, uh, guys, Floyd Christensen, the Rummels boys, uh, 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 Marge, and. Um, and Stubb were two of the greatest fans that any football team could ever have. I don't think they ever missed maybe one game in their entire adult lives, I think I read one time. Uh, just a tremendous fan support back then and, and uh, wonderful people. Gosh, I could go on and on about all the people here in town that were big influences on us. While no one team stands out during the 1970s, there were several teams with winning records. 
Dwight Spangler and Gary Kubik led the team through 1975. That year, Roger Hansen came back for one season. He then gave the reins to Tom Nosbish, a West Branch alum who would become the third winningest coach in school history. Well, after uh, I went to Upper Iowa and played with Warren Pierce and Dwight Spangler, who uh, also have a West Branch connection, obviously, uh, I went to Applington and uh, coached six years up there, four years as a head coach. Came back to West Branch, uh, Roger Hansen, uh, who is my high school coach, uh, for three years. Uh, we had a conversation. He wanted me to be his assistant when he went back into coaching. So came down here and assisted him one year before he left the school system, and then I became a head coach for the for seven years. Then. Tom Nosbish was the head coach at the time. Uh, we had a the season before we had a, some difficulties struggling and we had a losing season and we turned it all around and decided we're going to have a winning season that year. Uh, we had a pretty good team. We had um, standing room only at some of the, the, the games at uh, Oliphant Field. It was pretty neat seeing that um, three, four deep. The tradition, the stuff you hear from preschool up and then the anticipation and then making it work and doing it. It meant a lot. It was it was a lot of work looking back on it, um, the early morning practices and things like that. But it was a lot of fun. It was just uh, it was a way to get out of work too uh, on the farm. But uh, it was it was um, a lot of fun. The the players we played with and the coaches we played for were awesome. Just you know, a uh, great bunch of people. I, had a, I admired when I was younger, but they called him Animal, Steve Hemingway, kind of a, a very aggressive guy. I enjoyed watching him play football. Ed Moore was uh, kind of an idol of mine when I was a little guy. He was a lineman. Uh, my brother Scott played uh, football 72 as his senior year. I kind of enjoyed watching him play linebacker. That's where I learned a lot of it. Just back in our day, the rivalry was against West Liberty, and those were always good games. It was always the last game of the year, and that was a big battle. And I think my junior and senior year, we beat them both times. And, and Mount Vernon was always good and so on, of course. Was a, you know, in the late 60s, I was, I was young, I was watching a lot of, of football, and uh, the Nash, Nash boys, I, I really enjoyed watching them, and, and Bob Peterson as quarterback back then, um, those are some of the guys that I really uh, enjoyed watching. Yeah, as a, as a grade school kid, uh, I think it was one of the things I remember most is there had been a big tree on the west side of the football field and they had uh, cut it down and so there was this huge stump that was probably 15 feet in diameter and so it was a real cool thing to be the grade school kids that got to sit on this tree stump and uh, watch the games and uh, my biggest imagination is or my biggest memory is always seeing the team at the top of the hill at the top of the steps before they would come down before the game and seeing them getting jumped up and then seeing them all run down together and I remember that as a, as a little kid all the time and I, I remember seeing Butch play as a, as a high school because I'd have been in, in junior high then um, and I remember seeing uh, the Nash boys um, I remember seeing Warren Pierce you know run and then uh, once I got into you know junior high and, and freshman and sophomore years and then I really started understanding what it was all about Roger Hansen was our coach. He followed us from seventh grade till fresh off till, till our senior year. And it's kind of neat having a, the same coach. And he was very successful years ago. And you heard about that and the mystique. And just having him follow us is kind of a, a neat thing. Do, yeah, we had to do caterpillars um, across the creek, usually. When we practiced out north of town, we had to run through the uh, horse weeds that were about 20 feet tall and uh, blaze a trail through those and then we'd go down through the creek and, and up, up the side of the bank and it was, it was always a lot of fun. There was a play when I was a senior over in Clear Creek. Uh, we had a pretty emotional game. A player on my team, Jerry Sexton, got a broken leg early in the game and kind of got everybody pumped up and Nosbish and uh, Peterson they used to give away an award called the Stick of the Week Award. I was chalking up a few of those on the wall, I've still got them, and I had a hit over there that was uh, on a quarterback by the name of Pitlick that I've seen since then, and he remembers it also. It was a 
pretty good hit. I so remember it that well. Been pretty good if it stuck with yeah, it, it, it was yeah. talked about. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We had a, a play we called Oklahoma, which a quarterback would hand off to a wing back, and, and then they would pitch it back, and usually a, the wide receiver is wide open. So it's kind of fun because. I'm an Oklahoma fan, so it's kind of neat they coined it that way. Coach Kubik um, was very good at pregame speeches and, and getting us fired up. Um, and then as a coach, you know, I watch Butch get the team fired up, or I watch, you know, Coach Rummels get the team fired up, and it makes you reflect back to, to when you were playing. I enjoyed him. He was a very good coach. Um, I wish I would have been probably worked a lot harder as I see what the results are of kids really working hard now um, in the weight room um, and what it takes to, to be a winner. My senior year, I think we went four and five, and so, um, and, and Mount Vernon was in our conference and they were state champs that year. And so um, we knew that they played good football around Eastern Iowa. And it was always hard-nosed football. You know, every game with uh, Solon and Tipton and West Liberty, it was the true conference rivals. Probably one of the plays was against uh, Solon um, as, as our homecoming junior year. Um, Solon was ranked pretty high and they were coming in undefeated and they were, they were uh, coming in on a high note. We ended up um, beating them pretty, pretty soundly uh, on our home field. But uh, one of the things I remember too before the game is uh, our field was not in real good shape. It had been a lot of rain that fall and, and there was a lot of dirt, you know, and mostly dirt on the field. And I remember seeing the Solon players out there on the field before the game out kicking around the dirt and, the, and it was really pretty hard too. So I know they weren't looking forward to, to playing West Branch that night, really. In 1979, Mark Rural became the first West Branch representative in Iowa's ultimate bowl game, the Shrine Bowl. We practiced down at Pella and we played at Drake Stadium. Uh, fine memory I have of Drake Stadium is it was full of ground bees. I don't know if anybody's ever seen a little brown, looks like a bumblebee. The football field was full of them and we ended up uh, having to stop for a while and treat and take care of some bees. So it was about 103 or 104 degrees that day. Since 1979, 20 West Branch players and coaches have represented the school in the All-Star Contest. West Branch where I was, uh, you want the short version or the long version? Uh, yeah. I can do either one, but I uh, went to the University of Iowa and uh, went from first string to sixth string in one day and uh, gradually worked my way back up to where I played uh, four years at the University of Iowa, lettering four times. Uh, and after that I was drafted by the New England Patriots in the 89 draft in the uh, third round um, and played there for five years, twice being voted to the Pro Bowl. And then I finished my career in Chicago in 1994 and then with the St. Louis Rams in 1995. Uh, well, Marv Cook obviously was probably the best player I ever coached. Um, and in Amplington, I, had a lot of, I know they have their own history too and there's a lot of great athletes up there, but Marv was a, a unique 
specimen of a, of a player. Uh, so he, obviously he, he stands out for what he's accomplished since high school. Playing at Iowa was tough. I mean, it, was, it wasn't just show up and, and have great things happen. I mean, there was a four to five year period there where it was a lot of tough, tough things going on. A lot of times I had to make choices on what I wanted to do and which direction I wanted to go. And, and uh, you know, just kept going back to my heart and, and the, the pride I had in this program and the pride I had in playing football. And, and it would push me through those barriers and those hard times and, and uh, never, ever forgetting where I came from. I mean, uh, the first Monday night game I played, Monday night football, okay? Philadelphia, that's when I was with the Bears. Literally the night before we went and saw the stadium and I yelled, West Branch. It was like a Hoosier moment for me, you know, like going into the big stadium and yelling Hickory. Uh, I literally yelled out West Branch. Now, 46 guys thought I was an absolute nut case. But I mean, it was like, I mean, if you want to play football, you better want to play on Monday night. You know, and that was my first opportunity. And, and it kind of goes full circle because my first thoughts when I was sitting there in the Philadelphia stadium was West Branch. You know, and this is where it all started for me. And I'm getting goosebumps thinking about that time. But, um, uh, I never ever, in all my steps of football, never ever forgot where it started or who, who it started with and that was my teammates at West Branch, the, the community of West Branch and, and it carried me through a long way. Well, I was, grew up in the Marv Cook era so of course, you know, Marv, you know, I wanted to catch passes like he, he did, didn't so much at West Branch but went on to do at Iowa, um, but uh, catching passes wasn't for me. I, Instead. All young West Branch athletes, of course, wanted to be Mark Cook. And that's just the way it was. He was great and uh, went on to do great things. But uh, Marv Cook, of course. I mean, he was the first guy I can remember going to the games as a youngster. I was probably third grade. Um, just the name Marv Cook. Uh, everybody wanted to be Marv, you know. I truly, in my heart, from the age of 10 years old on, felt like that that was what I was going to do. And to be honest with you, that's a dream that had to have come from my family, uh, my friends, my neighbors, the community, because, I mean, it's, you know, I, I vividly remember times as a sophomore in the summertime going for a, a country jog, you know, a three and a half mile country jog when all my buddies were taking the girls I wanted to date to Iowa City on dates. But, you know, I made conscious decisions back in those times that, that this is what I want to do. This is what I need to do if I want to accomplish my dreams. And so In the 1980s, the West Branch program started to take off. In Tom Nosbish's final two seasons, the team went 8-1 and one and 7-2 and two before another alum took over the program. A 1968 graduate of West Branch High School, James Butch Peterson played several different positions for Coach Roger Hansen. Butch and Larry Lurch Rummels were teammates on the 1966 team that finished the season undefeated. Little did they know at the time that the groundwork was being laid for a coaching duo that would transform the program. After graduating, Peterson attended Muscatine and Kirkwood Community Colleges and the University of Iowa. While still in college, he got the itch to start coaching and assisted Roger Gaylor at West Branch Junior High. After a couple years, he jumped to the fresh soft level for a season. Staying on the fast track, he became a varsity assistant the following year before taking over as defensive coordinator his third season. When Peterson took over for Tom Nosbish in 1983, he says he had to answer to many critics. A lot of people around town didn't want a couple of local kids coming back to lead the program because they didn't think they had the skills. Butch and Lurch wanted to immediately show everyone they could do the job and do it well. In order to help gain support, Butch tried to involve as many people from the community with the program, be it working on the chain gang, running the scoreboard, or taking videos of the game. Peterson says this helped promote the program from within the community, thus gaining the approval of those early critics. If you can't wear our uniform and have a lot of pride, then you probably shouldn't put it on in the first place. And we really try to stress the team atmosphere, caring for one another, the tradition of the program. Not only when we coached and played here, but the years before us, we've had football here for a long, long time. And that's what this film is all about, to show the chronicles of history throughout the years of West Branch football. It's a special, special history piece that you guys are all putting together. And I couldn't be any more pleased to have that thing and be a part of this particular film. 
One of the first things Butch did was increase the number of coaches on the staff to reduce the student-to-coach ratio. He had to make sure, though, that each one of them believed in the same system and was able to preach the same fundamentals to help build the program. While the fundamentals have remained the same, helping shape the technique the players use, Peterson is always trying to stay current with the changing trends so the Bears don't fall behind other programs in the state. I think Butch is a great organizer. He really has every facet of the games and the practice and um, all the little details that it means to, to be a championship. And the other thing that he does is um, he gets a lot of people involved in the program with his assistant coaches and his support people and the parents and the booster clubs. And he lets those people um, coach. You know, he lets his assistants coach and they do a very good job. And, and you just end up loving it. You just end up really looking forward to it. There's just nothing better than fall in West Branch and being involved in the, in the football program. When I first started, my first quarterback was Marvin Cook, who went on to be an NFL performer and an All-American at the University of Iowa. And it was a nice way to start off. And Brad Bartell and Mark Hyde, some of those kids, we went eight and one our first year. And then it just kind of built and built and built. Oh, you know, he, he gets uh, pretty fired up. Uh, He's hard on you, hard on you, but uh, I think he's he's he knows how to get the most out of each kid. You know, um, he's just a he's an excellent motivator. Um, you believe in him, you know, and uh, I just uh, he's just great for West Branch. He's been a great coach. A trend that Peterson picked up on early was weight training. West Branch was one of the few schools in Eastern Iowa that used weightlifting to gear up for football. He credits the players' devotion to weights in 1988 to the school's first playoff berth. After winning the state championship the following year, it showed the importance of lifting and started a routine that set the tone for the program. Although it took a few years, Butch and Lurch were able to implement an offensive system that they felt would be successful. In their first season, they were senior laden with Marv Cook as their quarterback, so they left the offense alone. At the time, the Bears were running a slot I. After the season, the two traveled to a coach's clinic in Nebraska. While there, they came across the wing tee, an offense that is built on misdirection, play action, and the option. They modified the playbook to fit what they wanted to do, and the base offense has been the same for the past 20 years. The offense looks different from year to year as the personnel are different, but the basic ideas remain the same. Since taking over the program, Peterson has experienced three state titles, 14 conference nice and district job. titles, nice and over 180 nice wins. Job, he says the best job, experience, though, Good was job, watching Glendon. his children go through nice school job, and participate in several different sports. He feels extra fortunate he was able to coach his two sons on the football field. One of the things Dad always taught us is that you had to be over and above everybody else just to get a step on the field, especially as a coach's son. And so just you had to put in that extra time and really work hard to uh, be able to step on the football field when you're the coach's son. It's been very special coaching my boys and also my daughter Carrie. Uh, it's very, very important to have a family tie and I think that having I had an opportunity to be around my three kids as student athletes at West Branch has been a real big plus for me. Peterson believes West Branch has always been a football community with a long, rich tradition. He does worry that success has spoiled the town, but that makes the players and coaches work that much harder to continue the success of previous teams. That hard work is sometimes taken for granted, but Peterson says for the program to achieve its lofty goals, it must be done. I guess I was one of the throwbacks, you know, being a little, uh, little kid in, in school every uh, Friday night making the trek to the Alphen Street Field to watch these, these uh, West Branch Bears teams play. And, uh, I had this uh, third and fourth grade teacher by the name of Peterson. I don't know if any of you know him or not, but uh, uh, Butch would is our, be Butch, that would be Peterson. Butch, yep. And even at that age, he was, he was talking to us about getting to the dome and instilling football in our minds. And, and I guess even uh, from a real young age, uh, football meant a lot to us. Um, just, just the excitement that you could see in the town and, and going and watching these uh, West Branch teams play. Uh, it was always a big family event for us, uh, uh, going to watch the Bears followed them all over the place, and I guess uh, West Branch football has just always been a huge part of my life. So, uh, And I remember Wally's old dad, old bullfrog, you know, uh, always always seeing the team bus, and, and along, you know, the same lines, I always remember uh, my dad sitting, he always was sitting in the same spot in his truck, and in every game as a player or as a, a coach, we always made it a point, I always made it a point to go by and touch the truck and say hello to dad, and, you know, just having, uh, 
people like that, the, the people I call the legends of West Branch football, the fans like that. Um, Ross Sexton, definitely. Uh, my dad, sure. And all of them, they were, <clears throat> you know, where people stood and you could come to the game and know exactly where to look to your left or right and see who'd be standing there every game. The things that I remember, I mean, I, my brother obviously playing four years ahead of me was somebody that I would watch a lot and emulate. Uh, Craig Verla was a great running back. Uh, Mike Lathrop was a good kicker. Uh, guys that kind of I knew from the community uh, in the neighborhood, watching them and then just wanting to, you know, be a part of it. I mean, I remember literally sitting in the end zone on the hill, and any time they would have a huddle like in the end zone, I would want to get as close to the, the back end line as I possibly could because, I mean, I wanted to be a part of West Branch football. I mean, that was from the time I was probably eight, nine, ten years old, you know, the kids on the hill. Uh, and any time they could get a huddle, I wanted to be in there. I wanted to hear what was being said. I wanted to you know, hear the, the comments and just be a part of that. And actually then, you know, years later, be a part of that is, is truly uh, a great, great feeling. And then here at West Branch, you had Beast Rummels, you had uh, Marv Cook, you had some other outstanding football players that you looked up to. And, and so, yeah, you had a lot of good role models. I'd probably have to say Rick Fountain. He was dedicated and just about unstoppable. His devotion was incredible. Uh, Rick Fountain was another great player on defense, uh, quite a linebacker, good hitter. Vic Capper, um, he just wanted to, you know, make those crushing hits like uh, Vic was one of the best at it. Um, I don't know if it says a lot about me, but the one thing I remember is we played Mount Vernon my senior year in Mount Vernon, and uh, we had a chance to win a game late, a fourth and one, and, and uh, we tried a quarterback sneak with me, and I didn't make the first down. and. Uh, uh, it cost us a chance to go undefeated that year and then qualify for the playoffs. And that was uh, probably, to take it a step further, I vividly remember a play where I threw an interception where I just uh, made a bad choice. And it's, it's the most vivid memory I have of West Branch football. Uh, but, uh, but, but, I mean, great games. You know, always great games with Mount Vernon, with, with Solon. But unfortunately, when you look back, that's probably the one that really I rem remember the most. And, and unfortunately, the Eastern Iowa Hawkeye Conference people I see in Iowa City or I've seen in the university, they always have a tendency to remember that one as well. <laughs> that was that crackback block that you had. Uh, I think that's going to be one of the all-time great blocks in West Branch. Yeah, a lot of people still come up to me and tell me about it. Uh, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was a punt return, and um, on our punt returns, we kind of, back then we all peeled off and kind of went back in a line and I was the first guy in the line, and this kid was, uh, he didn't see me coming. And uh, he wasn't my size, he was quite a bit smaller, so he got the worst of that one. After several years of moderate success, the coaching staff began to see their system implemented, and in 1988, the team made the playoffs for the first time. Despite losing in the first round, it gave the Bears a taste of success and motivated them for more. Our 88 team is a team sometimes I think that gets forgotten a little bit. That was the first uh, playoff team that ever came out of West Branch, and that meant a lot to me and to the community, I think, to be in the playoffs for the first time. Yeah, in 1988, we made the playoffs for the first time in the history of West Branch, and uh, it was one of those things that we were just really happy to be there. And, um, when we, you know, of course, we lost that first game, but it was a great learning experience. And, us, you know, we still ha have some good friends from that, that year. I'd probably have to say that it was something that was going to last for the rest of your life. Meaningful. Uh, the dedication, devotion by the coaching staff was incredible. And the togetherness that you felt was fantastic. I just like the memories that we have kids that work very hard here and that Coach Jim Bellamy told me one time that when he told his Mount Vernon people, when you play West Branch, you better tighten up your chin strap because those guys are going to hit you. I think that's a memory that sticks out a lot in my mind and because uh, I have a lot of respect for Coach Bellamy up at Mount Vernon. And uh, I know Coach Hanson, when he coached here, had a lot of respect for those two. And they used to battle each other a lot when they played and uh, coached against each other. A new emphasis on weight training made West Branch one of the most aggressive, hard-hitting Class 1A teams in the state. In 1989, the team returned to the playoffs. This time, though, it ended in Cedar Falls with a state championship trophy, leading into the most successful decade of football in the school's history. Well, you know, the 1989 championship game against Logan Magnolia sticks out. Um, because just coming into the Dome and... And even more than the week before, the semifinals when we were up there for the first time in program history. Um, 
there's just so many people there in, in red and red and white and black. I couldn't believe it. And um, I guess the the play that sticks out in my mind is when Pete Miller he banged off about five Logan Magnolia guys to score a touchdown late in the game that, that sealed it for us. And he was a great, great player on that team. In 1989, being able to go up to the Dome and then um, beating the East Buchanan team that, that was supposed to be unbeatable and uh, beating them bad and then uh, having that opportunity to play in the Dome and then win a state championship, first state championship in the history of West Branch. And uh, I guess my favorite moment, the moment that I'll always cherish is that after the the uh, game was over, um, being able to shake my dad's hand, give him a hug, um, knowing all the hard work that he has done and put into the program and all the hard work that we have put in, you know, to accomplish what we did. And uh, we we're very fortunate, my dad and I, that David Johnson got a picture of it, um, of us giving each other a, a high five, and that's something that's there forever. And uh, so I'd say my favorite moment is being able to really to put everything all together, all that hard work, bring it all together and win that state championship. And you know, some of my best friends today are still those guys that were on the line with me and in the backfield with me and on that state championship football team. And then up into the 89 season was our first state championship and my son Lance was on that team and we had a bunch of really good seniors that year and uh, showed us how to be winners. And then into 90 and 91, we won it again. And 92, we won it again. And then Kevin Braddock, J.D. Grimm, Chad Federland, a bunch of kids, and you hate to start naming people, Beans McCarty, Sean McCarty, I mean, on and on and on. Had a lot of good athletes. Uh, Danny Peterson was a, a, young, a young player on that team. But the 89 team was special to me because my son Lance played on that. It was just a great group of guys, and I think we just kept getting better and better. Um, um, to be the first team to win the state championship, the first team to make the playoffs in 88, and then the first team to play in the Dome. I, I, you know, that first time we stepped on the Dome, the fans were just crazy because that was the first time West Branch had ever been there, and, and it was just a great feeling. The run that West Branch football went on is truly incredible, and as a guy that was at the University of Iowa in the National Football League, trust me, I was looking back, and I was wanting to know how, how did things go in the Dome this week and, and uh, how the Bears were doing, and uh, I mean, they have truly you know, put this town on the map as far as state recognition goes with high school football. Well, you know, you, you don't think about it much back then. You know, you're just, you're just playing. Um, but as a kid, you know, football in West Branch was always the biggest deal. And, and when you weren't watching it, you were playing it on the playground. And you always couldn't wait for that chance to put on the pads in seventh grade and, and go for the first time. So, but I think after after you're out of the program and you kind of look back and you see all the championships and stuff, it, it, it means a little bit more, especially knowing that, you know, being, being a link in the chain that it goes back so far. I remember the paper doing a thing on the last one in West Branch, please turn off the light, when we first went up there and literally they took pictures around town and there was, there was nobody left that day, which, which I think was just a neat statement about the community that, you know, whether you had a kid in school or whether you knew somebody, everybody was going up there because they had a lot of town pride in the, in the football program.
coming off of a state championship, West Branch returned in 1990 looking to continue their success. Although the team won 10 games for the second year in a row, they bowed out in the semifinals of the playoffs. That loss would be the last one for almost three straight seasons. 1991 and 92 saw West Branch roll through their schedule and the playoff field on their way to perfect 13-0 seasons both years, giving the small town its third state championship in four years. Special. It was it was fun. You know, we had a good crew, a good group of kids, and you know the coaches. Uh, you know, they taught us well and great scouting reports, and we always were well prepared. And, you know, didn't think of anything else, but you know, where the next one's going to come from. The whole '91 season was special because I was a senior. Um, the previous year in '90, we lost uh, a close ball game to Parkersburg, 12 to 16, and uh, came down to the wire. Uh, J.D. Grimm threw me a pass in the end zone, I dropped it, and uh, that's how we lost that game. That game would have put us into the uh, uh, championship game and could have possibly had four championships in a row if it wasn't for that 90 season. We won in 89 and then 91, 92. So, um, the 90 season was, you know, that whole off season going into 1991 kind of was a motivating factor since we lost that close game the year before. We just wanted to get back up to the Dome and the championship game. Um, I just, you knew it was your last game and came out, ended up having 311 yards and it was just a, it's like a dream. So. We were stalling a drive just to let the time run out and, you know, looking across at the huddle, you know, Gordy sitting up there at the quarterback and we're all just kind of looking at each other and looking up at, you know, the Giants at the line with Cliff and Kyle and Jason and mm -hmm. they're just, uh, you know, smiles across everybody's faces. We're sitting there and we know we've got the game in hand after all the work's been done and, you know, just pretty excited about bringing another title back to West Branch. So. The one game that sticks out most in my mind would be our senior year at Columbus Junction. You know, it was just a, a great football game. And, uh, you know, we got down early, but uh, we stuck together, and uh, you know, that's what West Branch football about. I would say the rivalry between uh, West Branch and Solon was always a fun one. And then we went to district play, and my senior year, without a doubt, would have been Appleton Parkersburg up the dome. Beating them. Yeah, all six. Been an overtime they were game. tough. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think the biggest game that I've been involved in, and from a coaching standpoint, was when we played. Uh, Appleton Parkersburg up at the Dome in the semifinals up there and we, we it was a real emotional game first they'd have the momentum and things were going their way and then all of a sudden things would switch and we'd be moving the ball and we scored and then the game end up tied and we went into overtime with them and uh, they had such a talented football team they had four division one players Jared Reeves who's playing professional football now and his brother and a couple other guys that went, went on to play you know, Division One sports, and uh, for us to come come through and, and win that thing in overtime that day was just uh, a really a, a great football game and a great victory for West Branch. Uh, it came down to the final play of the game where uh, Ryan Gordon bootlegged around the end and walked into the end zone, although not really walked in, but was led in by Cliff Bowie, and uh, that was really a great football game. Played with Tigger, Kevin Stout, um, Kyle Jones, Jason Grimm, uh, Cliff Bowie, Kirk Anderson, Andy Messenger, Chris McNamara, Ryan Glazebrook. Uh, so you guys had a good core of football yeah. players. Yeah, we had a good core. And we had, you know, my junior year we had a good group of seniors, and my senior year we had a good group of juniors still. So. You know, playing football West Branch is just, uh, just kind of a uh, natural progression to your life, I guess, if you're a student or an athlete or a student at West Branch. It's just something that you uh, you grow up with, and it's, uh, it's just the natural thing to do. And, and you know, when you're a young kid in West Branch, you go to football games on Monday night, and uh, you know, you go home, and you want to be there. And, you know, just the it, it just takes a lot of hard work to be successful, and that's what everybody tries to do in their life and that's kind of what West Branch football is about, just working hard and trying to get the results you want and, you know. Basically I transferred from Tipton, uh, Tipton was the first game my senior year here. Um, this, I of course wasn't the captain, but the captain was with me, lead the team out on the field, um, and we won. That's kind of like the J.D. Graham. 
thought he was, uh, he always ran his team with class. He always played so hard and, you know, I, I just, I just loved his demeanor on the field. You know, he's had such control of every game he's ever been in, so I like that guy. Back in the days when Bob Peak was running and, you know, watching him and then all great, you go into high school and watching uh, Barney play and uh, Rick Fountain and those boys, Pat Reed and, you know, all those guys just, doing well, Jamie Laschek, you know, those guys are always fun to watch, they had so much talent, and, uh, you know, then watching, uh, you know, the juniors and seniors when I was a freshman, you know, John Hirschman and Zinkula and uh, Moose, and, you know, when you get down there to the class of 91, too, a bunch of you guys there. When I was little, I liked Matt Wheeler, and I always wanted to be a quarterback like him, and until I figured out I couldn't throw, but... <laughs> 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 but I liked him when I was little. I liked Aisha Jones too. He was good. Um, I always watched Matt Wheeler. He was at about the time that uh, he was playing quarterback. By the time that I was growing up, and we were playing out on the playgrounds, and I always looked up to Matt Wheeler. I know he was a really successful quarterback here at West Branch, and he was just somebody that I wanted to be like when I got older. It was a great time. It was an honor because when you're a little kid, you West Branch football is just kind of in your blood and. It's kind of a part of the town and it's a part of the tradition, so it's good to be a part of it. Your whole life, you just, everybody, all the guys in West Branch grew up wanting to play West Branch football. After going through the regular season undefeated in 1993, the Bears lost in the second round of the playoffs, ending their winning streak at 36 games. However, each year between 1989 and 1996, West Branch made the playoffs after going undefeated in the regular season, giving them a 62 game regular season win streak in that time, the team's record in all games was 85-7. and seven. As other schools across the state began to focus more on weight training, the Bears' success began to slow, at least in the eyes of the town that had grown accustomed to winning. Still, the team only missed the playoffs in 97, 99, and 2001, with winning records in all but one of those years. The Bears returned to the Dome for the state semifinals in 2003 and made the playoffs for four consecutive years heading into the future. For much of my career, I played against West Branch, knew the tradition. Um, when I got here, I got to be part of it and actually see what it meant um, and its total community involvement, um, total community atmosphere, um, unity of the team. It's everything you would hear um, not being a part of it, it actually was that. I, mean, I was injured a lot of my senior year or whatever. And saw all my best friends go down in the game and uh, I decided it was time to come back off the injury list and uh, take my shoulder basically to my arm so I couldn't even use one of my arms but I had to be out there with my best friends you know and go back to war with them and I didn't care if it meant I was going to have to have surgery again you know after the season I was going to go play no matter what and uh, put on that red and white a couple more games and even though I played with one arm I was going to do it no matter what so. Yeah I had my West Branch Bears jersey I'd wear that school on, on Friday, and uh, usually my grandma lives in town here, so I'd go to her house and I'd be up there at 5 o'clock, whatever, right, right before the open kickoff of the press off game. And I always had my playing with my football. And...
Everybody's working hard tonight. Know your role and everybody works hard. Special teams, we start with kickoff. You alone guys for the show for you tonight, guys. You're going to be the first one to knock somebody down. Set the tone right off the bat. Defense, bring it out. And also, it's going to go to work tonight. As I always say, boys, tonight, it is 48 minutes to hell. West Branch, stop you all Everything you've got, every single play. That's the way you play West Branch football. You leave it all on the field. All on the field. We got some things to make up for for last week, don't we? You got to be smart. You got to think. You got to execute. We've had a great week of practice. We're in better shape than they are. It's our homecoming. It's your last homecoming, seniors. When I come here someday, then lift. And we've been to the dome quite a few times, and we had a lot of uh, potassium. You got to eat bananas on that. You got to really hydrate yourself with water. You have to understand that you have to stay focused. You're going to be excited. We took them out on the field a little bit early so they could get used to the environment of the dome. Welcome to the inner dome, fellas. Tonight, when this door opens up, you're going to have the biggest rush of your life. You're going to hear that band playing, and it's going to be the greatest feeling that you've ever had in your life. Just like always. 48 minutes of hell, West Branch style! It's a swift kick and it takes a funny hop. Taking it at the 15, down to the 10, and the Bears are uh, getting close to a touchdown. Touchdown, West Branch. No, they ruined it. The Bears ball at the one yard line. We thought it was a touchdown. Things happened this year in the dome that I had never seen in my career, and that's a, uh, a, the opening kickoff being recovered by us on the one yard line. 18 years, never seen that before. Momentum is very important in the game of football, and our first kick by, by Grebaum really set the tone for that game, and I think it really demoralized them. The Bears recover the ball on the BCLUW uh, one yard line to start this football game. Quarterback sneak, and Ewald goes in for a touchdown with six seconds gone in this football game. Stick together, play together, play hard, play together like you've done all year long. Hit people, get aggressive on defense. Special teams got to make plays. Offense, control the football. Control the football and put some points on the board. Let's go out and prove a point. Let's start walking down, let's go. Welcome to round three of the playoffs, boys. You thought last week was something. Wait till the garage door opens today. Our crowd's ready, boys. I hope you're ready. Tonight, all the talking's done. We shut them up on the opening kickoff. Defense, screen out, offense. Right away we go to work. Set the tone early. Set the tone often. You know why? You know why? Forty eight on the tail, West Branch style. Down the eight on three. One, two, three. Down the I'm awful proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> You've had a very great career. There's nothing to be ashamed of. You've given it everything you've ever asked for. You've given it everything you've ever asked for. Yeah. intimidate this opponent. That's the name of West Branch football. Not because I say so, but because that's the name of West Branch football. This game is going to be what into the Montezuma game? Springboard. A springboard into the Montezuma game. <laughs> We probably work kids harder in our football program than any 
in any program in the state of Iowa. We pride ourselves in being in good physical condition. Touchdown Bears! Touchdown Bears! Warren and Riley! It's just a huge honor to come play here. He could go! He could go! Caleb Water! It's very difficult to, to make a state tournament appearance, and we've been there 15 times, uh, won three state championships, have won 12 conference or district championships. And those kids answered the bell from the very beginning. And holy Toledo, there goes big old David English rumbling down the field. I think he's going to score. The walk to the field, everybody lines up on the side of the road and watches the ice. It's a feeling, a great feeling to have. Goes to the outside, has Ruby down that side. The 40, 35, Ricky Riley. And these kids just work their tails off. Touchdown Bears! Touchdown Bears! Back has time, has a man down there. That's Riley. Throws it, has a man wide open. This could go for a touchdown. That's Sutton down the left side. They need to get to about the bare 26 yard line for this first and 10. Quarterback snaked by Waters. Best editor, the 35 40. He could go. He could go. That's one of the better runs you're ever going to see. 54 yards and a touchdown. Let's it go. Has a good one. Touchdown Bears! What? 24 hour rule, and then we'll think about it. Well, not even 24 hour rule, we're gonna start in the morning. Good. Yeah. 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 Bob Cummings was a play player at Iowa, and he came over to Iowa as their head coach. And I know he had, and other college coaches do the same thing, they'll have their, their teams walk through the crowd and it kind of gets them excited and you really have a feeling of unity. The walk down the street, down to the field is, I don't know, it just kind of, it gets you up for the game. But when we get off that bus, you just, you just get chills going up your spine, you know, you're, when you get off that, you're ready to play. The crowd comes up and they line up down the street and you just kind of get that excitement. Personally, I just like the sound of how the cleats go, and it just sounds kind of cool and it gives you goosebumps every time you do it, but it's, it's a neat feeling, that's for sure. And when you walk down and see all the people in the field down there, it's pretty awesome. I think if you just watch the players and the coaches and their eyes, you'll see the pride that they get by walking up that street, and, and, and it gives the parents and the fans a great chance to uh, kind of get, get a little bit of momentum built up before the game even starts. I wanted to community to know it's their team walking up that street and to hear those shoes on the pavement uh, if you can't get turned on for football at that point then you need to go do something else. The history that we have in the game and even the history we have in our field. The field that we play on is laden with history and it seems like when you walk out on that field you know there's been so many before you that you need to live up to a tradition that has been laid down before you. That's the way I seen it when I played there. I talk about how intimidated they must be going to Little Rose Bowl. You know, in the, in the environment we have in West Branch in that stadium is truly incredible. I mean, the, and my son, when we see the bear prints going up Elephant Field, you know, Elephant Road there, and I mean, it's just, I mean, it's ingrained and, and it's something that never, ever leaves you. That, uh, that Elephant Street field is, is a, it's a must, you gotta win there. That's all there is to it. When you walk down on that field, um, and looking up at the stands and looking up at all the fans that you're just in awe of what a spectacular event it was. You know, seeing Oliphant Street Field and seeing everybody dressed in red and white, um, that I really got to appreciate it more, um, what sort of uh, event it was for the town. 
the younger kids are running around, of course, down the hill, the older people are up in their cars, students, everyone, people that have graduated come, coming back. Um, it's, like I said, it's once you're part of it, you know you're always part of it. And you they want you to win, obviously. Uh, sometimes we may have created a monster, but on the other, on the other hand, if they have it that way, then nobody having any interest in it. And uh, there's the downtown quarterbacks, and they know how to do that. And we've also, you know, often told them to come out and help us a little bit, but they normally don't do that. But if we really need them, they're going to be there for us, and uh, that's what it's all about. To, to go into the dome, for example, and see to see a sea of red. I mean, and it's all West Branch people, uh, from the littlest kid in, in his diapers to an old senior citizen. I mean, that's pretty special. Everything you got today, fellas. Everything you got. Get in there. On three. On three, team. One, two, three, three. Let's go. One of the funniest things is if you look at the old team posters, you see who the ball boys were that were in second and third grade, and then, you know, ten years later, you know, they're the running back on the football team or the, the linebacker on the football team. And so you just see a an evolution of what it means to be involved in this program. You have people from gener one generation to the next that put a lot of time in and really care about it. And so all the kids in the community from a young age know from the time they're four years old that this is something special. And so when somebody that they respect, a player or a coach comes and tells them, well, you know, you need to start working on this. You need to start being stronger at this might not hurt you to go out for Pee Wee football here. And, and The tradition, I mean, West Branch is so rich in the football tradition. I mean, people know that West Branch is a winning football team, and they want to come support you, and they want to see you win. I know growing up, uh, looking forward to Friday nights and seeing the lights uh, turn on at the field and couldn't wait to get up to the field to, to watch a game. Uh, as in a lot of small communities, it, it's a central meeting place for, for in the fall. The integrity of the coaching staff, the fans, and it hasn't changed any since the intensity level hasn't changed any since I left. You really can't put into words what it's like here, you know. I've had the opportunity to put on many, many different uniforms and stuff, but nothing, nothing can count up, you know, what it's like putting on that red and white on a Friday night, you know, and playing under the lights back home, you know, it's pretty cool. We lived to play football here at West Branch. I mean, I remember growing up, and I still would love to play for West Branch football to this day. Because come from a tra tradition like this, I think it was easier to fit in, like playing college football, and you learn so much, like hard work and dedication, and like what it takes to actually like be the champion that you want to be. And the fan support in West Branch is always awesome, and uh, it it was. It was really neat to go to town and just and you run into every, everybody you run into was, was uh, always interested in football and, and what are you doing and how you doing. And I think teamwork and family is kind of summarizes West Branch. The tradition and the, the ongoing thing with the community, whatever that thing is, it's still there. You grow up here, you, uh, you pay some dues, usually playing some sports, so you get to know a lot of people. And then uh, as you grow on in life, you end up giving back, whether you help coach or you're in municipal duties or whatever. The West Branch is a very tight community, good, a good community. I, I haven't got enough good to say about West Branch. It's just unbelievable. We had an announcer up in the press box who was saying his Hail Marys and using his rosary beads, and we were winning the ball game, and he fell over backwards and almost knocked himself out, and that happened to be you, Wayne. And that's something I know that we talked about many, many times afterwards. When the feet were up in the air, Wayne still had a hold of the microphone doing the play-by-play. -play. I'm just very grateful to be a real small part of a huge success story here at West Branch. Uh, I think West Branch football has been one of the premier programs in the state in the decade of the 90s. Um, I've just been very fortunate that Butch has been a good friend, needed somebody to do this for him, and uh, it was started out as me doing this one year, now it's been 18, so uh, uh, it's been something that I've truly enjoyed and he's allowed me to be a part of something very special in my lifetime. Just, to th I think, a lesson for the future is that the, the number one component is team chemistry. Now, what is team chemistry? That's something you feel in your heart. 
you can't explain any type of team chemistry, you just have to feel it. It's a great uh, tradition here, and the parents and the, the community just rally behind the team. It's just a neat thing to be a part of, have been a part of. So. West Branch, you think of football. Uh, I know they've had some great basketball teams here, good track teams and whatnot, but West Branch is definitely a football town. It's uh, the, the whole community gets behind the football team here. Well, actually sports all together, but football is the number one sport. It means a lot. I can't ever remember. I've been watching football since the early 30s of having a losing season in that many years. It's a football community. The coaching staff they have, and, and I just hope it carries on. It's just a beautiful thing to be a part of it, just being a citizen in, of West Branch. West Branch has always been a football town and always will be and we have great support from the parents and, and the school administration and all the people of the community and it's just been a labor of love for all of us and it's going to always be that way at West Branch because it's a football town. That's, that's West Branch football! That's, that's West Branch football! That's West Branch football! That's West Branch football! That's West Branch football. Let's watch Red Football!